Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me this morning for my daily Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. Um, we're going to start with a daily reflection on the Book of Mormon. Today is Monday the 15th. The fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. First Nephi chapter six, verse four. Some records are more conductive to bringing conducive, are more conducive to bringing people unto Christ than others. Historical accounts of archaeology Genealogy and wars are interesting and important, but they may not bring us to the one true God. On the smaller plates, Nephi was commanded to concentrate on spiritual matters, the dealings and revelations of God with the family of Lehi. Nephi and his descendants, who had editorial responsibilities for the plates, were solemnly selective in what they recorded always considering the purpose for which this set of plates was written and preserved. The Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel and was written plainly and simply to bring people to Jehovah, our Christ and Lord. Nephi understood that his duty was to write the things of God, to teach us what we must do to gain peace in this life and eternal salvation in the life to come. I only laugh a little because that's the verse I chose for my hope. I mean, we're okay. So we're in first Nephi chapter six today and there's only six verses. So there's only so much we can pick, but I chose verse four, um, because Nephi's hope was that through his actions and his words, he would lead people to Christ. And I wrote on my little heart, I wrote, am I leading people to Christ through my actions and my words and my deeds? Is that my hope? Is that something that is a desire of my heart? That's something I need to look inwardly about. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a missionary or have a, the, the missionary gene or the missionary desire, but I do want to teach my family and my friends what I learn about the gospel. Um, Sorry, I can hear Joey at the top of the stairs calling my name. Her teeny tiny little voice calling my name. Now she's crying. Hang on, I'm very sorry. Joey, what is going on? Yeah, do you want to play on the floor? Yeah. Okay, go play on the floor, babe. I'm very sorry. I could stop and start over, but I don't want to. Okay, so we're going to go into our commentary. And um, he pulls out, uh, I desire room that I may write the things of God. Among, among God's greatest gifts to mankind is the gift of his word. Granted as a loving endowment to build faith, secure obedience, and open the gateway to immortality and eternal life. The mission of prophets is to preserve the word, this word and convey it to God's children. Nephi is commanded to make plates and to engrave thereon the record of his people and the record of his father, including Lehi and Nephi's own prophecies. 
that he might persuade men to come unto Christ. All scriptures testify of Christ. They are testaments or witnesses of our Savior. Go back upstairs. We are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. They are written to invite all to come unto Christ and to per and be perfected in him. I'm so distracted right now. Okay, and then he talks about how, in verse 6, not of worth. Uh, these plates with things which are not of worth unto the children of men. What the prophets include in the sacred canon is of inestimable worth from the beginning the lord declared scripture to be the standard for human behavior and action and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone only but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. I'm trying to have thoughts. And I'm sure there's something there. In, in my mind, there's images flashing of my lesson yesterday where I was trying to teach the, the 9 and 10 year olds about the scriptures being important, about why Nephi and, I'm going to sneeze, why Nephi and all of them had to go back, <coughs> excuse me, had to go back and get the scriptures and why when Lehi, yes honey, a package? Yeah, for you. For me? Yeah. It's on the porch? Yeah. Upstairs, are you sure? Yeah. I don't think you're sure. Um, everything's gone now. Uh, why the scriptures are of worth and is what I write in my journal worth anything? That's kind of the circulation that's happening in my brain are my journals of of worth of 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 worth no are my journals of worth not of of worth goodness gracious i'm so distracted but let's close out the come follow me portion of this video with a daily reading on prayer today is the 15th and this one is by Gerald N. Lund. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. There is almost an ascending order in those three commands. Asking is primarily a verbal action. Seeking implies a higher level of involvement. When we seek, we begin to do something. The word implies an earnestness that commits both the mind and the heart the intellect, and the emotions. Finally, knocking suggests some actual physical action. <clears throat> the implication is also that once the door is open, we will move through it, for that was the purpose of our knocking. The Lord drew on that later latter imagery in one of the letters to the seven churches in Asia, including included in the book of Revelation. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. <clears throat> Alexander, please, I'm just trying to do my video, okay? Okay. So let's move into our general conference challenge. It's Monday, there's nothing, and I didn't find my patriarchal blessing yesterday i'm going to clean my, i've i've been redecorating my room so it's a disaster um so i'm gonna clean my room today and hopefully i find it okay today is day 15 of lord teach me to pray in 28 days she's got some interesting things to say today um 
Those who believe that Christ's death not only brought our redemption, bought our redemption from sin, but also purchased to com purchase the complete healing of our bodies are great proponents of the believe, confess, and it's yours type of praying. Some refer to it as a faith message. They say believing is not enough. You must have faith. So that's the first interesting thing that she... Alexander, please. I'm trying... Alexander, I'm doing my video. You need to go upstairs. Uh, that's the first interesting thing that she points out is the difference between, that there is a difference between believing and faith. What is the difference? She says that it is action. Um, a positive confession activates belief. What you say is what you get. Therefore, negative confessions are a lack of faith. You are not believing God. Thus, God cannot answer your prayers. So if... If you are of the believe, confess, and it's yours, if you pray and you don't get it, then you didn't have faith. Um, she goes into more depth about this in the book, and it's very interesting. And you, you can know these type of people. You've seen them out in the world. It's, you know, well, that person died because you don't have faith. Um, um, let's see. Uh, how do they biblically support this teaching? I cannot begin to touch on all the proof, their proof texts. However, one major scripture reference is in Matthew 21, which we looked at in part yesterday. Matthew 21, verses 18 through 22, and then she wanted us to mark the following words. She gives us two scriptures and then wants us to mark the words. Faith, doubt, believe, or believing, and say. Now in the morning, when he returned to the city, he became angry, hungry, and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said unto it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered, and seeing this, the disciples marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered and said unto them, well, don't eat it, honey. It could be gross. Truly I say unto you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it shall happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Uh, then she gives Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 23 through 24 which basically says the same thing. Truly I say unto you, whosoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it shall be granted him. Therefore I say unto you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they shall be granted you. Um, if you took these verses from Matthew and Mark and isolated them from the rest of scripture, then you could make them support the believe, confess, and you've got it theology. And according to these texts, if it didn't work, you could say it was because you doubted. Um, but you cannot isolate scripture. All scripture must agree. Scripture cannot contradict scripture. Therefore, if you are going to understand the true nature of prayer and all its workings, Alexander, stop it. You must know all about the word of God that it teaches on this subject. You cannot take John chapter 14, verse 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it and run with it. To do so would be disastrous. So then she includes a letter from somebody who watched who watches her beloved ministries or whatever. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, but she's saying in her letter that thank you for teaching this, this principle. Um, it's really dangerous that there's so many Christians out there who um, shun you because your prayers aren't answered or 
um, if you are struggling physically or mentally or spiritually and you need to talk to somebody but you can't talk to anyone because you may be accused of a negative confession. I know how it hurts to want to surrender to the Lord you love, to want to surrender to his will with all your heart, but be told that if you do that, you're opening the door to the devil. That if you pray thy will be done, you're showing a dangerous lack of faith and allowing the devil to get a toehold. That was also an interesting idea. That some thy will be done is part of the Lord's Prayer. It's part of that like pick and choose theology, which is inter uh, it's not interesting it's confusing to me uh if you say thy will be done like anyways uh, um as though the devil has such power that you have to stay on your toes day and night to keep your healing etc as though your faith were in your faith rather than the almighty all powerful all loving all holy all just god it hurts me, Kay. It hurts to see Christians with this view of God that I know now know is distorted. It hurts to see Christians demanding things of their father like spoiled children and then turn and be actually hostile to those who don't have enough faith to believe like they do. How it must grieve our dear Lord Jesus when he sees us behave this way. Another interesting point in this is this believe confess and it's yours type thing making demands on heavenly father saying they will be done leaving it open to him and his plan but instead demanding things of him i have faith that you're going to do this so you have to do it end of story could you imagine praying like that could you imagine telling heavenly father what to do like, you're going to do this because I want it and I will, and I believe that it will happen. End of story. Make it happen. I believe it will happen. Could you imagine that? Um, and then she just goes on. Um, Kay asks, where does your theology come from? Do you believe because of men's teachings and experiences or because you have dug out truths from God's word yourself, precept upon precept? That's a very good question. Where do you get your theology from? Where do you get your belief from? Is it from the prophets and apostles teaching or have you gained your own testimony? That's something we talked to my primary class yesterday as well, is gaining a testimony of your own and where does it come from and how can you do it? Uh, okay, and then she goes into some other stuff, which I don't agree with, um, because she, she doesn't know everything that I know, but, um, stop, stop. No, not what I said. Stop. Why don't you go upstairs? Um, and talking about healing, how they believe that healing is for everyone. Um, uh, those who believe that healing is for everyone often cite Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 5 as a proof text, saying that physical healing is part of the atonement. By that, they mean that Christ's death won our healing, and therefore we only have to claim it in believing prayer or confession. Then she goes on to cite it surely our grief he himself bore and our sorrows he carried yet we ourselves esteem him stricken smitten of god and afflicted but he was pierced through for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities and chastened for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed and then she wants us to look up uh, matthew eight fourteen through 17 and in this, it talks about how Jesus laid his hands on the sick and they were healed. And that's what she's saying. Isaiah is saying that he literally healed people by putting his hands on them. Not that he took our infirmities upon him through the atonement. That's not what she's saying. Isaiah 53 is saying that, that he took our infirmities upon himself, our sicknesses, our, our hardships. And she's saying, no, 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 no. That's not what happened through the atonement. He's not doing that to be closer to you. Don't do it. 
He didn't do that as part of the atonement so that he could relate to you so that you could have that somebody who knows exactly what you're going through. He didn't take that as part of the atonement. No, no, no. He actually healed people with his hands. That's what she's saying here. And I'm like, no. Um, and then she wants us to do, oh goodness, there's another page. Um, she wants us to do an activity where we write down the five W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how, um, through verse Isaiah 53 verses four through five and Matthew chapter eight verses 14 through 17. Um, where is the, it occurring? Why does God tell us what he does in verse 17? How did the healing take place? By the way, you may want to write out Matthew 8 verses 14 through 17 in your Bible next to Isaiah 53, 4, and then do the same cross-referencing by writing Isaiah 53, 4 in the margin beside Matthew 8, 14 through 17, like cross. Now look at 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25 and cross-reference it with Isaiah 53, 5. Again, ask the same five W's and the H and record your insights. Go back upstairs. Why are you telling I am doing my video. Please don't make me yell on camera. Stop. Go back upstairs. As you read the verses in 1 Peter, note what we are heal healed of and when and how. Um... Let's see. Some final. I like. Are you done to be done with this already? If you would let me finish. Can you just do one more chapter and then that's it? I'm trying to, but you guys keep interrupting me. All right. I, I'm going to try to finish this out. I'm going to try. Um, I went through this with my precious father. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God could heal him and let him live. But when God didn't, I didn't carry the guilt that I could have spared his life if I had enough faith. Why? Because I knew the whole counsel of God on the subject. That is what is important, my friend, not just to, to proof text some doctrine, but to study it thoroughly and get the whole truth. That's the gist of the thing. And if I had any sort of brain cells left of concentration. Daddy? Yeah, honey? Mm -hmm. yeah. No. Anyways. Look, the pain comes for me. For me. For you? What? For me. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Today was a crap show. Um, that was First Nephi Chapter 6 and General Conference Challenge Day 15. This is what happens when the kids wake up early. Okay. Um, that's all. Okay. Tomorrow we do Chapter 7. And then... Wednesday chapter 8, Thursday chapter 9, Friday chapter 10, and then Saturday and Sunday we do general conference talks. Hopefully the rest of the week will not be like today. All right, I've got to go. I can't think of anything else. I love you all. Have a great day. Thank you for being here.